Katie was your everyday, happy-go-lucky 18-year-old girl. She was adopted at a young age by two loving parents and was living life to the fullest. That was until Katie reunited with her biological parents, and everything that Katie thought she knew changed, and Katie's happy-go-lucky life turned into a sexual and dangerous nightmare. Hey guys, I'm Annie Elise. This is 10 to Life. Go ahead and pause really quick to smash that like button, push that subscribe button if you're not subscribed already, and let's dive right into it. 10 to Life with Annie Elise starts right now. We are taking a quick break in today's case to have a word from our sponsor. Okay guys, so if you're like me, you have probably every streaming service and platform that you can think of. It seems like every single week, either a new exclusive documentary or a new piece of content, something is being released and it's never on the same streaming service, which has resulted in me having a subscription to basically everything. And I've gotta say that Magellan TV is the absolute hidden jewel of all of them because Magellan TV adds over 20 hours of new content every single week. So you will never, ever, ever, ever run out of things to binge. And they have the largest and best collection of true crime shows anywhere, which is obviously perfect for me. Magellan TV is all about the drama of real life, famous real life cases, the lives of serial killers, the nature of the criminal mind, you name it. I just added to my queue the mind of Mark DeFriest, an unforgiving system, which is about notorious escape artist Mark DeFriest, where he's now coming up for parole after 30 years behind bars. But even though he spent 30 years behind bars, they got to look at his past to make a decision for his future. So you know I'm ordering my Froyo tonight, I'm putting on my fuzzy socks, and I am going to be watching that. Magellan TV is the best value of any premium documentary streaming service in both price and quality. 4K is always included in your subscription and get this, there are no ads ever. I know you all like that if you're like me, no ads ever. Let me say it again for those in the back, no ads ever. And I also love that they give back to the true crime community and help sponsor my favorite gathering of all of you true crime fans, CrimeCon. And because Magellan is so amazing and such an amazing partner of the 10 to Life channel, they are giving all of you viewers a free month long trial. All you have to do is go to the link in my description and boom, you are hooked up. So guys, go watch, get your free month on, tell me what you watch, let me know so I can add it to my list too and they have all different genres not just true crime so like if you're into space like my son Theo right now is obsessed and he tells me every single day that he wants to live on Jupiter which trust me kid I get it me too they have a whole space section they've got history I mean they've got it all so guys run don't walk go to the link in my description and try your free month with Magellan TV Stephen Platel was born on April 6th 1975 in Levittown New York there's not much known about Stephen's childhood. However, there are some things that we do know. Stephen lived with his mother and was known to have an explosive temper. And as he got older, he started displaying a bit of behavior. Some described Stephen as unusual and with a passion for guns, saying that he was a pretty quiet kid and often was bullied in his younger years. He was apparently most often bullied for wearing the same jersey every single day. Jumping to 1995, Stephen was now 20 years old. With Stephen being described as a loner, it's no shock that he took to the internet to meet friends and potential suitors. One day while Stephen was surfing the web online, he met a 15-year-old girl named Alyssa from Texas, which is a huge red flag already. No 20-year-old man should be like hitting up a 15-year-old child. No, no, no. But Stephen didn't care, and the two of them spoke often and one could even say they quickly fell in love. Stephen couldn't wait to meet Alyssa in person and drove all the way from New York all the way to Texas. After meeting, the two of them seemed to hit it off because before anybody knew it, Alyssa had run away from home to be with Stephen. Not long after, Alyssa became pregnant and gave birth to a beautiful, healthy baby girl that they named Denise. But this new love, bliss, and baby makes three dream comb come true situation wasn't all sunshine and rainbows, not at all. Steven certainly had his share of problems. With Alyssa, Steven remained violent and angry, temperamental and unpredictable throughout their life together. Steven couldn't hold a job and that also put all of the pressure on Alyssa. Steven always seemed to have difficulty earning a steady income and was also very abusive. He would threaten Alyssa regularly that if she was gone, he would blow his figure out a way to record it to make sure that the video got to her. A pretty insane 
and controlling thing to say someone who loves you and who, um, I don't know, you're supposed to love. And Stephen continued to demonstrate very aggressive patterns with Alyssa, even after having the baby. Alyssa was growing more and more concerned, and she knew that something had to be done. So when their baby girl was just eight months old, Alyssa made the ultimate sacrifice, and she put her up for adoption. She didn't want their daughter growing up in such a tumultuous household and was genuinely fearful for her safety. She also was concerned of their circumstances, being young and facing financial hardships, now all of this as well. Plus, she also believed that Stephen had physically hurt their baby. Alyssa said Stephen would pinch the infant brutally until her body was black and blue, which I can't even imagine. And Alyssa also claimed that he would stuff their baby in a cooler to drown out her crying until the baby was on the verge of suffocation. Which I mean, wow, if that doesn't scream, we gotta get out of here, I don't know what does. But as much as this disturbed and hurt Alyssa, she was also terrified of Stephen. She too was a target of his. She was so much younger and she didn't know how to stand up to him to get him to stop the violence. So she did the only thing she knew how to do to protect her daughter which was getting her out of there with a family who loved her and would treat her well. Alyssa said, I knew from the very beginning that I had to get the baby away from him to give her a chance in life. So a lovely couple named Anthony Fusco and his wife Kelly adopted this little baby girl and they renamed her Katie, a new name with a new start with a new family. They raised Katie in Dover, about 80 miles north of New York City, and they had a very normal life. Anthony, who was better known as Tony, and Kelly, from all accounts, gave Katie a great life, living in a smaller trailer park community that was described as a sleepy town with good people, good families, and life finally started to seem normal for little Katie. Katie was very reserved and pretty shy. She was also a foodie, but because of Katie's love and passion for animals, she was a vegetarian. <laughs> she loved all animals, but specifically, Katie loved rescuing stray cats. But as I mentioned, she's a foodie, and she loved food so much that her family actually nicknamed her Pac-Man. Katie was on the cheer team, she was an aspiring artist, and was very well known in Dover High School for drawing comic strips. She was also a talented drummer, and she was planning on attending college to pursue a career in digital advertising. By all accounts, it looked like Katie was on track for success. And Katie once wrote in a blog post, a pen and something to draw on became a safe place for me. Ink became my weapon against rules and regulations for me. A life without art is no life at all. Katie graduated from Dover High School in 2016. And although Katie had plans of attending college, she also had some other things in her life that she was itching to pursue and find out. You see, Katie knew that she was adopted. And after turning 18 in January of 2016, Katie, who was very curious about her birth parents, went on a mission to find them. Now at this point, back at Stephen and Alyssa's home, the two of them were still together, shockingly. Even with all of the chaos and toxicity that seemed to be in their relationship, they remained together. And in 2007, Alyssa gave birth to her and Stephen's second child. Alyssa felt like at that point they were older, they had matured, and they were finally ready to be parents. And in 2012, a couple of years later, Stephen and Alyssa welcomed their third child. So as stated before, Katie was on a mission to find her birth parents. So she did what most of us would do, and she took to social media. She found them and messaged them on Facebook. And they seemed to create a bond with each other just through messaging. So it was Katie's goal to take it a step further and meet them in person. Now remember, at this point, Katie is 18, and she had plans of attending college. But after she spent so much time speaking with her birth parents and getting closer with them, her priorities seemed to switch. Instead of going to college in August 2016 as planned, Katie finally reunited with her birth parents. The reunion went well, they got close, they had a great time, and shortly after reuniting, she made the decision that she wanted to move in with her biological family. And they welcomed her with open arms, and they were all excited for the future. Although Katie's adoptive parents, Tony and Kelly, were apprehensive, they thought that Katie was old enough now to make her own decisions, and they ultimately supported her. Not known to Katie or her adoptive parents, however, were that things at the Plato home were already going awry. Stephen and Alyssa had already made the decision to separate, and they were sleeping in separate rooms. Alyssa had also still been suffering from emotional and verbal torment by her husband, Stephen. This went on for years. She was always on eggshells, and whatever his mood was, everybody knew it. 
and that mood was often not happy. A lot of yelling and a lot of things smashed in the house in front of their children. So at this point, I'm not really sure if Stephen and Alyssa were just putting on a front as a happy family and a happy marriage, or if Katie ever picked up on all of this negative energy. But it seemed like everybody was happy and ready to move forward. One day, Alyssa made the decision to tell Katie privately about the reason for her adoption and how it was for her own safety due to what she suffered as a baby at the hands of Stephen. But apparently, Katie didn't appear to be very concerned by this at all which I could imagine was a bit of a shock and would maybe take some time to digest. However, the news only seemed to bring Stephen and Katie closer. After Katie reunited with Alyssa and Stephen, Stephen's behavior also changed pretty drastically after meeting Katie. He began wearing skinny jeans and form-fitting shirts. He even shaved his beard and let his hair grow out, trying to have like this new, younger, hipper look, maybe trying to just be a young, hip dad, or was it something else? Was he going back to his predatory ways when he was 20 years old and sought out a 15-year-old girl? Things quickly took a very disturbing turn. About six weeks after Katie moved in, Stephen one night decided to sleep on the floor of her room, which immediately concerned Alyssa, as it would most people. Why are you as a grown man sleeping on your now adult daughter's floor in her room? It's creepy, it's weird, it's yuck. So Alyssa rightfully so was angry and confronted him about it. Stephen told Alyssa that it was none of her business and then he stormed out of the house with Katie. Not long after that, in November 2016, Alyssa had finally had enough of Stephen. She was done, she was leaving, and she moved out leaving Stephen, but still sharing custody of their two children. This left Stephen all alone with Katie. And now, with nobody in his way, Stephen was starting to fall in love with Katie. But here is where things start to take an even worse turn. About six months later, in May of 2017, Alyssa was reading her 11-year-old daughter's journal when she came across an entry with some pretty disturbing information. It's difficult to read, but she writes, My dad calls her baby his baby. My dad even says she is my stepmom, WTF. Her daughter also drew a picture with a big belly illustrating Katie's pregnancy. Alyssa was now learning of the incestuous relationship between Stephen and her daughter, Katie. And she was also learning that Katie had become pregnant through this relationship. Alyssa flew into a rage and became hysterical, and she called Stephen immediately. She confronted him asking what the hell is going on, to which Stephen simply responded, I thought you knew that we were in love. Alyssa started screaming and cussing at him, saying, how could you? You're sick. She's a child. She's your child. And she was hysterical and very upset. So she didn't hesitate. She contacted the police right away to report it. However, unbelievably, no arrests were made at the time. On July 20th, 2017, just two months after his divorce from Alyssa was finalized, Stephen married Katie with Tony and Kelly, Katie's adoptive parents, by Katie's side. And Stephen's mom was by his side. Katie posted a picture of the two of them captioning it, nothing fancy, just love. I'm sorry, but what in the actual cesspool garbage is this? Not only did it happen, but the parents who were responsible for raising, loving, protecting Katie, the adoptive parents, were also there and they were supporting it. Katie's adoptive parents even posed for a photo on the wedding day alongside with Stephen, Katie, and Stephen's mother. According to records, Stephen and Katie lied on their paperwork and application, saying that they were unrelated. Her adoptive parents, Tony and Kelly, thought that there was nothing they could do, so they decided that it was best just to support Katie. Uh, no, there is something you could do. You could tell the courts the truth, you could go to the police, you could publicly shame Stephen until he, like, runs away like a little... I mean, there were countless things that could have been done. Soon after the wedding, Katie gave birth to that baby that she was pregnant with, a baby boy named Bennett. And she and Stephen moved into a nice house on a cul-de-sac in a suburban area in Knightsdale, North Carolina. They were living the honeymoon life. They were happy and in love. Their new baby, it's sick and twisted, but from the outside looking in, I guess you would never know that. And let's just say that that disgusting and vile honeymoon phase and wedding bliss didn't last very long. The two of them finally were arrested on charges in January, just a few months after Bennett was born. However, they quickly bonded out and were released. A judge ordered them not to contact each other, which neither of them were happy with, of course. And at the time, Stephen's mother took custody of their son, Bennett. Stephen's lawyer, Rick Friedman, made some pretty disturbing and disgusting 
comments where you're going to want to be like, uh, the audacity, because he says there was never an allegation that Stephen pressured Katie into a relationship. He says, and I quote, this case is an 18 year old girl who shows up at the doorstep of a 40 year old man who's going through difficult times with his wife. They have a bond because they're biologically related, but they never knew each other before they had a sexual relationship. He was head over heels in love with her so much that it outweighed the issue of them being biologically related. Uh, no bro. No, no, no. Nice try. After the arrest and being bailed out, Katie really didn't have anywhere to go. So she moved back in with her adoptive parents, Tony and Kelly, and Bennett stayed in Stephen's mom's custody, and Stephen was beginning to spiral with Katie being so far away from him. He was still in North Carolina, and she was in upstate New York, and he was starting to become unhinged. And when Katie moved back in with Tony and Kelly, she started to slowly come to her senses, because soon Katie wanted out of their relationship for good. And despite the judge's order, Katie managed to get in contact with Stephen, and she ended things. About four months after the arrests and Katie coming to her senses, on Wednesday, April 11th, 2018, Stephen went and picked up Lynnell Bennett from his mother's care and brought him back to his house for a visit. The next day, Stephen rented a minivan, grabbed some liquor, and drove about 500 miles north to New York where Katie was living. Katie routinely would go to her adoptive grandparents' house in a nearby town every Tuesday and Thursday to clean, and this Thursday was no different. They had no idea that Stephen had plans to drive to New York, so she hopped in the car with her adoptive dad, Tony, and they headed out to her grandparents' house. Unbeknownst to them, right across the way, Stephen was watching them leave from his minivan. Stephen creeps out of the road, trying to go unnoticed, and proceeds to follow them. And minutes later, at a stop sign, Stephen finally caught up to Katie and Tony. Witnesses frantically called 911 to report what they had just seen, someone opening fire on two people. Stephen had pulled up next to Katie and Tony and fired several rounds with a rifle. Katie and Tony were fatally shot. It's on Route 7 and Route 55. Someone just went by and shot this guy in the truck. A witness describes to police the brazen murder of 56-year-old Anthony Fusco and his adopted daughter Katie Plato in broad daylight at a busy New Milford intersection Thursday morning. The car pulled up, went around him, shot him. Please say the gunman is 42-year-old Stephen Plato, the biological father of 20-year-old Katie. Can you describe the vehicle to me? It's a blue minivan. Based on witness accounts, police were able to identify the gunman's vehicle, finding it within an hour over the New York border in Dover. The suspected gunman dead of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Now it continues to get even more twisted. After this, Stephen reportedly called his mom admitting to killing Katie and Tony. But that wasn't all. He also admitted to killing the son that he shared with Katie, little Bennett. His mom immediately started to panic and became hysterical and called 911. It's believed that Stephen killed Bennett the day before, after he picked Bennett up from his mother's house and before he left his house to attack Katie. The cause of death wasn't released and there were no physical signs of trauma when they did the autopsy. So it's believed that Stephen killed Bennett by means of suffocation. In the 911 call where Stephen's mother hysterically called the police, she told the dispatcher her son had said he killed the baby. Can you 911, add us to the emergency. Yes. Um, uh, my son just called me, and uh, he told me he... Oh, my God. In North Carolina, uh, he killed his, his baby, and he's in the house. Okay, you said that he told you he killed his baby. Okay, ma'am, listen to me. What's your name? Okay, tell me exactly what happened. Uh, he, he's, I, he's, he's not home. His wife broke up with him over the phone yesterday. And he told me, she's in New York, and he told me he was, on his way, he called me last night and said he's on his way. He's going to bring the baby to her, and then he was coming back. And he just, he just, okay. he said he doesn't have, he killed his wife, he killed her father, and he, I can't even believe this is happening. Okay. And did this happen in Nightdale? Uh, no, the, the, the. His wife and father are in New York. Okay, and, so the incident but, but actually... But he left, he left the baby dead when he left. 
Okay, where did, where did he leave the baby? Okay, he said it was in the... <laughs> What's your son's name? <laughs> What's his last name? Same as mine. When did oh, this he, happen? He said he left last night. He called me, I forget, maybe about seven last night and said he was on his way to New York. He was going to bring to his wife and give it to her. And then he'd be back. And and he called me this morning. I, I just got up the phone just a couple of minutes ago. And he told and I oh God, he told me to call the police that I shouldn't go over there. Okay, so the son is uh, so your son is not there. No, though the house is empty. The, oh, he said he put a key under the front mat to take a key to get into the house under the front mat. Did he say how oh, he my. did it or what? No, he did? and I I didn't ask him. I didn't ask him. I didn't want to know. Oh my God! He's such a wonderful little. Boy. Okay, hold, hold hold on just a second, okay? <laughs> and that Stephen also admitted to killing his wife and her adoptive father, Tony. Stephen's mother also told law enforcement his wife broke up with him yesterday over the phone. She's in New York, and he told me he was on his way there. And after bringing the baby to her, he was coming back. I can't believe this is happening. It's believed that Katie leaving Stephen is what set Stephen off and ultimately what led him to do the unthinkable. When police arrived at the scene in Connecticut, they found Katie and Tony dead, and the truck was riddled with bullet holes. Police were now set, though, on finding Bennett, the baby. They immediately went to Stephen's house in North Carolina, where they sadly found baby Bennett alone and dead inside of Stephen's closet. So police started their manhunt for Stephen. However, the manhunt came to an end very quickly and very abruptly when they located the minivan and found Stephen dead inside with a self-inflicted gunshot wound just 30 minutes later. In a news conference, Police Chief Sean Boyne revealed that Stephen had used an assault-style weapon similar to an AR-15 to kill Katie and Tony. Now, as you can imagine, not only back then, but still now, Alyssa really struggles to make sense of it all. She describes Stephen as someone throughout their relationship that was dangerous, both physically and verbally, but also says that he never was inappropriate sexually with their children, so she never expected him to fall into a relationship with their child. However, what we do know about Stephen is that he did pursue Alyssa over the internet when she was just 15 years old. Alyssa also recalls that he always showed an interest with guns and even had a small collection. Stephen would often threaten Alyssa with violence, so this always had her on the edge of the seat. And here is Alyssa talking about how she felt and recalls a little bit of what went on in their relationship. He was verbally, emotionally, and mentally abused our 20 years together. He did do many violent things. He had nearly beaten to death one cat and did beat to death another cat. He would go long periods of time of not talking to his family. He was extremely isolated. Any friends he had were mostly online. He owned many guns, he couldn't keep a job. Alyssa says he even abused Katie as a baby before they gave her up for adoption. The adoption actually happened because I was worried about Katie's safety. She would cry and it would just instantly trigger him. He would curse, he would tell me to shut her the hell up. Uh, he would at times scoop her up and place her into a big cooler that we had. And then um, sometimes he would he would just shut it tight. He knew it was possible she could be dead, and he was not phased by it. So I would finally go back there and open it and get her out. He was a special kind of scary to me, and I did not know how to get away from that without getting myself or Katie killed at an even younger age. She was paranoid to the point where after she left him, if somebody would slow down next to her or stop, she would be scared that it was him. Alyssa says that she believes Stephen always held hope that he and Katie would get Bennett back and be back together as a family. It seems that when Katie made it clear that they were over, that's when he lost it. He couldn't live without her, and he didn't want her living without him. This case is truly heartbreaking and incredibly disturbing. At the end of the day, Stephen was in a position of power, and he clearly used that to his advantage into getting into a relationship with Alyssa and eventually his own daughter, Katie. Alyssa has now lost her firstborn daughter three times over, which is the most painful thing I could imagine. She states, I'm grieving, I'm sad, I'm upset, 
but I also want to have something good come out of this. If it's to get the truth out there to open people's eyes to in fine. This was an absolutely devastating and heartbreaking end to a very disturbing case. I'm glad that Alyssa is committed to her children and staying strong to take care of herself and her family. Now, I'm no doctor or expert, so please do your own research on this, but there is a term for what Katie and Stephen may have experienced, and it's called genetic sexual attraction. It's a concept in which a strong sexual attraction may develop between close blood relatives who meet as adults for the very first time. The brain forms an attachment, a bond, and an attraction to apparently reverse the trauma that the brain had experienced. But in my opinion, even if Stephen and Katie were experiencing those feelings and couldn't overcome them, which I don't believe necessarily, but let's just say they were experiencing these feelings, it was their brain, they couldn't control it. There were plenty of other people who weren't overcome by those feelings, who could have stepped in to stop it from happening and stop what was going on. And if someone had, three lives very well may have been saved. This is just like the ultimate foul, disgusting story ever. We hear about sexual relationships and families all the time, unfortunately, usually one-sided, most oftentimes one-sided. To hear about this kind of thing when it's two grown adults and then the tragedy that ensued after having a baby together too, I want to add in, it's a whole different level of like gross. And I'm sorry, but I don't believe whether it is a condition or you know, something that happens and triggers in the brain, I don't think there's an excuse for it ever. You know right from wrong. And I think the same argument could be applied to cheating. So even if you're overcome with these feelings of attraction and bonding and this is my soulmate, your brain knows it's wrong. Your brain knows that's your child. Your brain knows that's your father, which Katie did once they were separated in all fairness start to, you know, see more clearly. It just blows my mind that shit like this actually happens in the world because it's like disgusting, gross, it makes me want to vom. So I apologize if you just ate because I'm sure it's going to come right back up now. But guys, I'm sorry. I'm just bringing you the cases and I don't, I'm not trying to get you sick, but sometimes that happens. So anyways, let me know what you guys think though, because have you heard about situations like this? Have you heard about this case? Do you also believe that the condition is in fact real and it's an excuse of sorts for what went down? What do you make of it? It's bizarre. And what do you think his reason was for killing baby Bennett? Was it because he didn't want anybody to have him he didn't want anybody happy was it retaliation because he was the product of their love that was now fractured what was it let me know your thoughts in the comments below please don't forget on your way out to take a quick second to just give a thumbs up on this video if you appreciate the case coverage also subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already and turn your notification bell to on that way you will get notified of new videos as they drop which i have some crazy 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 ones in the pipeline they are coming out soon so don't miss them all right guys i will talk to you very soon and until the next case stay safe bye